I love how even though I tried to pick a non nerdy data one, it actually underneath the hood was a, n- a nerdy data one. You're like the you're a data hammer, and the whole world is just little nails that you're just trying to hammer with your you know like. But dude, this you, is the best you're business. You're hoovering there is. in the data like a vacuum. You're the data Dyson that's just taking in this data from everywhere you can. Yeah. yeah. Man, founders are like a lot of times not good at explaining what they do to idiots. So <laughs> can I do it? Can I? So, all right, I'm going to make you look cool. I'm going to be your wingman. All right, there we go. So you run a, I don't know if you call it software or a data business, but people pay subscriptions and uh, your your company, CB Insights, you're now getting close to 100 million a year in revenue, which is like a huge accomplishment, hundreds of employees as well. And basically, and this is the part that's kind of hard to understand for someone like Sean and I, because we haven't run like really, really huge companies. But basically, when a company that has a thousand people have to decide what software they have to buy, like, let's say it's just like some customer support software or payroll or something, they need to do tons and tons of research to make sure that the business that they're going to pick, the vendor they're going to pick, like, will stay in business or will be around for 10 or 20 years, things like that as well as a bunch of other information. And you have crawled through what you call dirty data. So all this data out there exists, but you just put it in a bit of bits of software that make it really easy to digest and understand so a person can make a right and smart decision. And they pay you like 30 or 50 or $150,000 a year to access all that. Is that right? Sounds about right, yeah. And more importantly, fan of the show and prolific idea guy. Before this episode, before we did this episode, he sent over a Google sheet that is... 77 rows of random startup ideas which just tells me you're you you are you're one of us and um so this is great you made our job really easy we have a bunch of ideas we can go through uh there's a few kind of interesting cv insight stories that you've blogged about in the past i want to talk about but let's do those at the end because uh i think the ideas are going to be a lot more fun Sam, you and, favorited and by the yours. Way, Sean, yeah. one of the reasons why he's fun, you said that he's one of us because the idea thing, that's true. He's also fun because even though he comes off like this like polite guy who's like uh, introverted, he's a shithead. Anand's a shithead. His Twitter <laughs> is hilarious. He always, he writes this famous newsletter to like 500,000 people now and he signs it with like, I love you. And in his Twitter, the bio says, um, please buy a CB Insights subscription. I owe people money. And like, he always does like, <laughs> He he kind of pokes the bear a bunch in, in his stuff, so he's got that. He's got a really cool attitude, um, but hopefully we'll get that out of you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, my, my my kids were uh, my kids were excited that you called me a shithead, so I appreciate that one. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, all right, so here, here we go. Uh, Sam, you put your favorites on the sheet. I put my favorites. What's interesting to me is we have almost no overlap. You, uh, only maybe two out of the 10 that you put down there were my favorites. I had completely different ones. I'll tell and you so why. I say we take turns right. where we say, tell us about blah, blah, blah. Like the little, the little three set, three word tagline. And he gets to pitch it and let's react and let's try to get through a bunch of these. So we might go on random okay. tangents or drill down, but like, let's in general, try to go, uh, you know, an inch deep on each one of these for now. You want me to go first? Yeah, you go. So the reason why I highlight basically everything I highlighted. So CB Insights interests me because basically you're not coming up with any data. You're just organizing data that already exists in really easy to understand ways. And then you're selling it at high fees. And I think that's like the greatest business model on earth. And you've listed out a bunch of ideas, including like six or seven that were more of these like data things. Data. So you had one in there called Sawdust Data, and you have examples. You're like, you can look at what the government does. Like the government has all this data. You can make that clearer and easier to understand for people. Um, Both the Sawdust Data as well as the uh, government data products. What do you mean by all that? Yeah, so Sawdust Data is people create products, and sometimes the residue of that product is actually really interesting data, right? And so that's the sawdust from the data. and so. It's basically taking that exhaust. And so I'll give you a couple of examples, right? You have, I'll just, and I don't know if these are businesses already, but you know, OpenTable and Resi have all this reservation data. I wonder if you could take that data exhaust and sell it to real estate firms, right? And they'd be, you know, hey, like reservations are down. This area is not as hot. Maybe this, this retail space is going to be on the market soon because this restaurant looks like a dog, right? That might be one area. You know, I think I met 
somebody who has uh, dog collars, like a like a Fitbit for dogs, right? Fi. Yeah, Fi, right. And so you could take that and probably sell that to pet insurance underwriters, right? So it's like, it's not your core business. It's this residue that comes off of your business that I think you could do interesting things with. Um, it's another example, like procurement management system. So kind of this like esoteric enterprise-y thing. But if you have all this spend going through this procurement management system at your company, could you go and sell that to hedge funds on like, hey, this company's you know, uh, average contract value is going down or it's getting a lot more seats sold this year, right? And so can you take, again, not your core business, and I don't think companies are really good at monetizing this on their own. So it's basically building this platform that goes to these companies and build these data products off of their sawdust. Does that make with, sense? With the, the business that Sean and I are and we're in newsletter business, like people have all these questions, but it's kind of broken down and do just a cute few things, which is just like figure out what content you can give people that they want to read every single day and then figure out how to acquire users for profit profitably. And that's basically the that's 80 percent of the business. What's like the 80, 20 thing for these like data businesses? Is there is there or or rather the 80, 20 for making messy data, clean data and make it a product that people like? The messy data to clean data thing, that's just like, you have to have a pain tolerance. That's all that is, right? And so I think this is why, this is actually, I think, why CBI has done well is like, we've had a bunch of Valley companies come in and they want to splash machine learning on it. And like, you just have to get into an Excel spreadsheet and clean the data. Like, that's just it. And if you're not willing to do that nasty work, you're kind of dead. I'd say the businesses that work are, I think like I, my framework is variable skew highly opaque, high consideration. And so I'll, I'll break that down. So high consideration means it, like somebody's taking risk or putting a lot of money out there, right? It's just like, it's got, there's some skin in the game. Opaque, meaning it's just hard to find, you know? And I think if you go into Slack groups and people are like, hey, does anybody know X? That's usually an asset class that's like opaque, right? Does anybody know who a good vendor is for this or a good software provider is for this? And then the last one is variable skew, which is like, like a car is a high consideration software purchase, but it's not really variable. Like it's got a set of features, you can compare them on a grid. And so the internet's really good for that. I like businesses where like the variability of the SKU is significant because you can't just put it into a table. You can't, like an iPhone's an iPhone is an iPhone, but like we, are, we launch Yardstick, like, you know, I don't know, a radiology software that uses, you know, that, AI reads radiology images, like those are totally different. And so right. that's like the framework I use. And so when it meets on those three, I think that's an interesting, messy, mm. hard business that's going to be a lot of pain, but like you could build a moat around that. All right, Sean, and you, you want to do it? Oh, sorry. You had ahead. one of your columns. So, so, so I told you you have 77 rows. So those are the different ideas. But then you had some columns. One of them was frame, frameworks or, or inflections. And that was your... That was one of your your things, opaque, variable skew, high consideration. The other one you had was tiny but growing niches, like or like inflection. Like it might be time uh, for that to grow. What is that? Is that your other one that you look for in ideas? And we can give an example here of like, uh, here, let me grab one. Like you did this representation media. So you said extend the Rebel Rebel Girls book for other communities, and then your framework was tiny but growing niches. So talk about that idea and explain it with that framework. Yeah. So Rebel Girls, if you're a parent of a daughter, you might be familiar with it. So we bought this book when my daughter was, you know, three, four. And it's just like one or two page stories of like famous women in history. So like Amelia Earhart, Marie Curie, Maya Angelou. And it's great. Like it's a it's a really kind of inspiring book, really cool artwork. That book is sold, I think, 5.5 million copies at like twenty dollars. So it's like one hundred ten million dollars. Wow. And that's probably dated. Right. But I think there's like this idea of like what I what I call representation media, right? I bet you could extend that to, uh, I don't know, like Hispanic entrepreneurs or like autistic scientists, right? Like people want to read about and see examples of success in their communities. And so I think you could extend Rebel Girls across a bunch of different things. And so that's the, I think that niche is growing, right? Like people, like you get these micro communities that actually are pretty large that would love to read about themselves and receive good representations of themselves. That's a great idea. Uh, I've had the, I've had a similar idea because uh, we get gifted some books that are like, uh, I don't know, like 
Hindu religion book or like, but it was like the kids version or something like that. It's like the, like, and it's like, oh yeah, if I'm going to read whatever, you know, Clifford, the big red dog, you know, like, is there, is there something that, you know, adds a little bit of something from our culture or religion, like makes it easy for me as a parent to like give them, you know, something I want to give them while still being entertaining and accessible. And there's actually just not much that's out there for that. So, so I definitely uh, think if you added up all those little, all those little different issues, that's, that could be quite big. Yeah. I mean, I think if you kind of un PC, if you found a story where the protagonist was like a little white kid, like make it a little Brown kid, make it a little black, right. kid, <laughs> you know, like modify the story a bit. And like, that's a winner. Right. Cause like, Kids love seeing like, oh, that kid looks like me. That's dope, right? And so like you're off to the races there. I don't think it's that. Like, nothing's hard. It just takes some work. But yeah. Dude, that's why my that's why my wife loves Kim Kardashian. She like sees them. She's like, oh, hey, look, they got fat asses too. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, uh, fat, fat in a good way, by the way. Fat in a good way. <laughs> when I met uh, the comedian Hassan uh, Minhaj, we, he, he was like doing his live shows. And I had told him, I was like, he asked me something like, oh, what would you do with if with my business if you were me? And I was like, dude, I would stop this like live touring thing that comedians do. Like, this is so painful. You're on the road, like, I don't know, 40 weeks out of 52 in a year. I wouldn't want to do that. I was like, you got to create a Broadway show. I was like, create like the next Hamilton. And then that goes on tour, right? Touring is a great business, but you just don't want to be the guy sitting on the stage. I was like, use your creative and comedic genius to do that. That was my, my kind of big idea for him. He said, all right, what's the show? And I was like, ah, dude, I don't know. Now, now I'm out of my, <laughs> my, my depth. And then the next, like a week later, I just sent him a voice note and I go, Aladdin, but, but Aladdin's black. <laughs> and then he's like, what? And that was my whole voice note. And then he goes, um, what are you talking about? And I go, remember the Broadway show thing? I go, it's Aladdin, but they don't, it, it's not like Jasmine, can't marry Aladdin because he's like a poor guy. No, no, no. Jasmine can't marry him because he's black. Because like, you know, this, her family doesn't approve. And then he's like, okay, so it's just he's black instead of poor. And I was like, hey, look, when you say it that way, it doesn't sound that good. But like, I'm telling you, there's something to this idea of he overcomes and they fall in love and the love wins. And he's like, all right, yeah, yeah, I'll add that one to the list. And yeah, I was like, right. to the list. <laughs> yeah, that's what he said. He's like, stick to podcasting, Sean. <laughs> Well, yeah, um, representation media. All right. Can I ask you about one? This is actually really fascinating. And actually, I think can be a bigger business than, than I don't know if you think, but bigger business than a lot of people think. A daily executive briefing email. Yeah. I don't, I, I'm not sure how big this one could be. I think I, I, I don't know if I put it in the sheet. I said you have like a dollar column, which is kind of like my indication of how big it is. I think this is like a great side hustle business, right? So I, when I worked at American Express, Every morning, our CEO would get like a briefing from his chief of staff, right? Like, you know, here's what Capital One did. Here's what Citi did yesterday. Here's what Visa did, whatever. And it was just like basically that person's job to like scour the internet and like look at financials and product launches and all this stuff. And there was a company that Cision bought called Bulletin Intelligence, which I don't think, I don't know how much they're doing with it, but it was basically that idea. It was going to be like your morning chief of staff email and yeah, I think this is an awesome business that like somebody smart and industrious can can build. And you, I think if you go niche, meaning like go financial services, because like if you get Amex, like the CEO of Citigroup, like cares about, or Citibank cares about mostly the same company. So you can reuse a lot of it. And it's not just the CEO, it's all like their division presidents and their right. like geography, like, you know, heads and all that stuff. So yeah, I think this is like, and you know, I'm sure with generative AI and stuff, you could like make this really like efficient. But yeah, I think this is like a tens of millions of dollars business. No, I think you're way off. So um, have you heard of, you guys know Politico, right? Yeah. It's like a, Politico is like a news website for DC, all politics, but it's not from a, like a CNN, Fox News, pers per, news perspective. It's more so like people who work in politics, they read Politico. Whatever. That's not interesting. What's interesting is that they sold recently to Axel Springer for over a billion dollars and where they got roughly nine figures, so 100 million plus of recurring revenue, where they have this, they have this service called Politico Pro. Have you guys heard of, not, have you heard of Politico Pro? No. I mean, I know that's a premium offer. I don't know what's in it. So basically, I think it's like a thousand a month. I forget the pricing. So someone's going to like get on me, but they have this, they, their pricing 
But the, the it basically, it's for if you're a lawyer um, or if you work in D.C. and you have to know what type of laws are happening at like a real rate, like, who you know, like, hey, the Senate is thinking about changing this like because we heard this senator say this in the news, yada, yada, yada. Well, anyway, they have these things called pro briefings and they send at least one a day, but sometimes more than one a day. And it's really fast, short emails. And that's your briefing of what's happening that day with uh, with like a very, very, very niche thing. So, for example, uh, they have a segment just for pharmaceutical uh, companies. So if you're a pharmaceutical and you want to know right away what's happening with the new laws, uh, or if you want to dive deeper and read about researchers, or if you just want to have a, a conversation with an analyst, you spend thousands of dollars a year, tens of thousands of tens of thousands a year, and that's basically what you're getting is this briefing as well as a few other things. They scaled this business to north of a hundred million in recurring revenue, and it's pretty fascinating. And there's a few others doing that, and so I think if you could actually pick the right thing, whether that's pharma, legal, I don't know what else there would be. Um, uh, all different types of finance, I think you could actually build a really interesting daily briefing business. And you could even have a user say which companies they want to spy on a little bit more than normal. And I think you could charge tens of thousands of dollars a year for a subscription like that. Yeah, you can charge a lot for this. Like these folks, like as long as you deliver quality in the morning when they need it, like, yeah, there's, they have sort of massive budgets. And I think Bulletin had Bezos as a customer for a while. So like he was reading the Bulletin Intelligence briefing every morning. So what's that company called? Bulletin? Bulletin Intelligence. Cision bought him many years ago. Dude, the reason why I like I like talking to you is like you and I are some of the few people that nerd out on there's like all these <laughs> data businesses out there. So you and I for years have talked about there's like uh, Informa, which is like a $10 billion market cap basically data and trade show business. Then there's Euro Money, which we've talked about, another publicly traded company. There's uh, Cision, which like is just kind of an older company that no, it just, they, these companies are just huge and they're just not sexy. So they're not talked about with our circle, but they're crazy fascinating to like learn about these companies because their margins could be huge. Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a build once, sell multiple times kind of business, right? So like once you build that data asset or that info asset, like you can keep selling it. So. Yeah, they're great businesses. They're unsexy, which is always good because like then you don't get all the smart people kind of trying to come in and, you know, eat your take your lunch money. So, yeah, I like these businesses a lot. You you had one on here also that was the uh, pricing data. So it was like go extract the pricing data from every SaaS tool and you know, go to their go to their website, find the prices, organize all that information for things where it requires a demo, quote like, I don't know, send a you know, Five dollar an hour employee through that process, collect the pricing data. Now you have it. Now you can make that visible where they are hiding it on their website, and you basically have a giant what, like a search engine or a database of, of, okay, if I want to use some email, you know, send software, here's the here's how the prices compare across them. Is that what the idea would be for that? Yeah, one? I think the idea there is. I think you start with public SaaS pages, and you figure out how to crawl them, or just you know, mTurk them, or something. Uh, and then, yeah, email service provider, what's the pricing? What are the features? I think the real killer there, which is, you know, maybe borderline is like you actually, cause a lot of enterprise companies don't put their pricing on their page. So you hire somebody who goes and pretends that they're a customer and gets the right. pricing. And then that's really, really valuable. Right. Because like now if I'm, cause pricing is like a dark art in B2B, you're like, <laughs> yeah, sounds good. Right. And then like, everybody's got opinions and nobody has data. So I think you could actually do something really interesting there, like long term, if you actually called companies and got that pricing um, or talk to their customers and you get their pricing. But that, that's actually the tagline. It was the tagline on your website, which is uh, without data, you're just another idiot with an opinion or something like that. I think <laughs> dude, that's great. <laughs> it was great. Right. I don't know. Do you guys use that? Are anymore? You we don't use that anymore. I think we, we still use like <laughs> in God, we trust all others got to bring data. Like, so we'll use that in some, <laughs> who, uh, who, who comes up with this stuff? This is you, or this is someone on your team. Who's like the witty copywriter. These are just stolen from other people who are, it's like a quote, the idiot one's a quote, I think. Right. I think both of these are like, you know, somebody like some luminary and, you know, we, we footnote them in small print and give them credit. Uh, <laughs> do, do, do you think that you guys being kind of silly is a, a leg up or do people criticize you? Yeah, I mean, we get some criticism, but honestly, like B2B is so mind-numbingly boring that 
like it's it's great as a way to stand out. But you know, I I tell the team like you know love us or hate us, you, you should have an opinion on us. And so that's the general theme, right? Because most of it's like pretty vanilla and you know just kind of like jargony. And so yeah, it's been it's been I'd say a net positive for us. But we've lost some customers over stuff we've said that offended them and what like what you know we did a ranking one of, of VCs once and we said. <laughs> a specific firm was losing in the ranking and it was just an objective thing. And they were like, we're canceling our subscription immediately. Right. And, uh, um, what a loser move of them. It just yeah. proves my point. <laughs> oh, you don't, you don't want access to data. Now you got, you got your feelings hurt and you canceled your own, your own data pipeline. <laughs> you're like, you're down another peg. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we've had, you know, that, and some people don't like, you know, I think when, Trump hysteria was going, we'd like sometimes put an infographic with him in it. And like, we didn't have an opinion, but it was just like, you just, him and Elon Musk, like if you mention them, it's just like lunatics come out, right? And so like, (laughs) uh, and so it's good for engagement, but it is definitely like a little bit, it can be odd. Like you say something and people just like, they've, you know, it's, it's a cult and people go kind of crazy. Like I, you, you always, you're a really good writer and, or whoever's writing is really good. And you guys always use things like, um, your headlines are really good, but then there's like just phrases all over, like it's built into your culture, like in your annual review, we're like, Hey, we did pretty good for a company that isn't lighting money on fire. Like the rest of the VC world or like, just like little (laughs) phrases like that. It just makes you stand out. And I think that that makes you have a voice and you guys are actually pretty good at that. Yeah. And I appreciate that. I mean, I think it's, you know, it's partly for the external market, it's partly for the team, right? Like you're selling B2B software. And so sometimes that can be like, you know, if you're 22 out of school, it's like, hey, that's not super inspiring. And I don't know exactly what that looks like. And then once we can show them, we can have personality, we're in the tech economy, which is interesting. So yeah, it works. It, it, you know, we, we screw up a bunch of things, but that's been good for us. If I was going to go out there and do what you said of getting all the data and like hiring people to call and, and actually get uh, quotes, who would I sell that to? On the software pricing? Yeah. I think you go to product teams at software companies and say like, you know, or your CR chief revenue officers and say like, hey, like, you know, do you know how you came up with your pricing? Like, you know, and here's what your peers are pricing at and give them like a snippet and give them a taste and be like, hey, and we have all this other detail behind it, right? How much would you charge? Uh... I mean, I don't think you start anything with like CROs at uh, big companies and like you start at, you know, twenty to $50,000, right? Like it's easier to go low than to start low and go high. We just, um, you just handed someone listening a pretty solid idea, right? I, I think that- I, I think the thing people do is they underprice. We did this in the beginning. Our first CB Insights when it started was 395 a month. And what you actually got was a bunch of people who didn't know how to use data who were a pain in the ass, right? And so it was like your worst nightmare. It was people who churned quickly, who paid you little, and who were blowing you up on chat all the time for support. And then I remember meeting a management consulting firm, and they were like, hey, can you add a couple zeros to the price? Because like one, your price will look like a joke internally. And two, I don't want to wait behind the guy paying $3.95 a month for service. So like, price is a indicator of quality is an indicator of other things beyond just like the core value of the product. So that was like eye opening to me. Like I was always like, Oh, you know, price low and, you know, do all that. And like, you know, now we're, we're orders of magnitude higher than we used when we started. That's awesome. Sean, what do you got? Uh, let's do some non data nerd ideas. So, um, I'm going to pick a different <laughs> do the college one. Rankings one. Yeah, yeah. Let's do the college rankings one. What did you call it? Broke and busted. <laughs> Broke and busted college rankings. Okay. So what? Uh, what's the what's the insight here? So I think U.S. News and World Report is sort of like the preeminent college rankings. There's been plenty of coverage about how that's a basic con, right? And like universities do all this sort of finagling to try to get higher in that. You know, I, I look. Can, how, how's that work? How, can yeah, they pay how, or what? What is? What's the? You know, con? I don't think it's that they paid. I think it's that like you know you've got these like subjective criteria, like uh, you know student to teacher ratio, right? And so like universities will like massage that data so it looks good, right? And so like you know that it's like a limited set of factors, um, and it's unclear how causal those factors are to actually getting a good education, right? And so I think you turn that on its head. Well, I think U.S. News and World Report 
you know, I think in like 2013, it was doing like 40 million in revenue. And now it has like, again, LinkedIn, 500 some odd employees. So I, I got to believe it's doing 100 million plus in revenue. And I'm assuming college rankings is the number one thing. So I think the thing you do here is you actually go to graduates of the school and just ask them for their W-2s. And you're like, how much are you making? Right. You just took on a bunch of debt. Like, does this place actually get you a job that gets you paid? Or are you like, you know, a server in a restaurant and you got like your two hundred thousand dollars in debt? And so I think you reach out to alumni, go get their W-2s and basically put a ranking together of here's how much I paid and here's how much I make when I get out. And if I'm a parent, I'll care about that. I'll be like. I don't really want to send my kid to a school where their prospects for employment are garbage. Um, and so I think it's like takes all of the, it's a very singular characteristic. So it doesn't take into consideration social life and all that other stuff. But it's like, I think it's pretty important, right? Especially you got all these people like leaving school with, you know, tons of debt. So that's the way I would do it. And you'd have to probably pay those students or ex students a little bit, but I think it's pretty cheap. And you probably go like, do like, New York colleges to start, like start niche, like don't try to be everywhere right out of the gate, like, you know, and then build out from like concentric circles from there. Do you wonder, like, I don't know about you, Sean, but like, what is, we're talking about some nerdy stuff here, but I, I, I find it like crazy fascinating because it's very clear to see the opportunity here. But what's shocking is like, when you say, oh, I'm going to go get the data, someone like me, I would be like, um, well, I got to go like Google it and like find a database. And you're like, no, I'll just like hire, like I'll use Mechanical Turk, you said earlier, or I'll just hire someone or I'll just like make a ton of phone calls and just doing that stuff, I can get interesting insights. Is, and is that really how a lot of this works? And, and the beauty of that business is 99, pe out of, uh, 99 people out of 100 won't do that work. So like once you built the data asset, like most people will think it's cool and they just won't do it. Like the other one that I like, which is, I don't know if I put on the page is, you know, I was uh, trying to get a pool built at my mom's house and like pool pricing is just like, it's opaque, highly variable and high consideration. And like, I have no idea what to pay for a pool. Like some kids should just go door to door at every person's house that has a pool and just be like, how much did you pay for your pool? And like, get the specs and then go find right. out and then find out what do they pay for per month for cleaning and whatever. I don't know what a pool requires and like literally build the database of like, <laughs> that's a great idea. Pools in North <laughs> Jersey. Here's what it costs. So like, yeah. Cause that's what people Google too, right? Like, uh, you know, pool, pool cost and then my city, right. That's a, that's a, a term that people will look for, or even if they're just looking at pool cost, but you have their, their city in the headline, they're going to click that one over the next one. And then you go back to the pool people and you're like, hey, listen, I got this pricing. Next time you want to bid, you probably need to know what your competitors are bidding. So like you can sell the data to both sides, right? Like, but right. it's definitely like, it's a perfect side hustle. Like, you know, it'd be like a thing that, I, you know, I hope my kids will like, just go do this like door to door and go get data. I love how even though I tried to pick a non-nerdy data one, it actually underneath the hood was a, a nerdy data one. You're like the... You're a data hammer and the whole world is just little nails that you're just trying to hammer with your, you know, like. But dude, this you, is the best you're business You're hoovering there is. in the data like a vacuum. You're the data Dyson that's just taking in this data from everywhere you can. Yeah, I, I mean, I love that business. I, and I actually think like not to get off on a digression, but I think this whole chat GPT thing is actually going to make private data like that much more valuable because right. like. You know, before it was like, oh, I'll give you my data and you'll just link to me and I'll get Google. But like like that's all going away, I think. And so like having access to private data is going to be really valuable. So I, yeah, I'm, I'm extra bullish. And do you look at like, for example, the, um, the pool one is a good one because it's probably not, the pricing is not probably changing all the time. Whereas maybe the college one, you got to redo the, the data collection every year in order for it to be accurate. Like for example, in the content game or the media game, which me and Sam think a lot more about is like, if anybody can do really well with evergreen content, that's so much better than somebody's doing what we were doing daily, daily emails where it's disposable and you got to recreate the product the next morning. Otherwise there is no product. And so do you think about that when it comes to data, like either the ease of collection or the longevity of the collection, like really makes the idea more valuable versus less? Yeah. I mean, I think you probably want data, 
maybe counterintuitively that requires a lot of refresh, right? Because like, that's mm. what keeps people subscribing, right? If I can get the data once and it's good for three years, it's like, all right, I'll get it. I'll churn. I'll come back to you in three years when it changes, when it's actually a little bit more, when there's a little more volatility to it, it's like, Hey, I need to know what's going on because like my business might suffer or what right. have you. In the case of the pool, when the pool owner is only going to buy it once, right? But you know that, but that's okay, right? Because like you could sell those leads to pool people. You could sell that to pool cleaners. Like you could do all sorts of interesting things with it, right? And so like, it doesn't have to be you're selling the data. You could build advertising and lead gen and other businesses off of it for sure. Okay, I got one that there's no way this can be a data one. A McCormick's Spice competitor. Yeah, I don't, this one, I don't have a lot. This is, you know, I think I have a column called Zone of Excellence and this one's out of my zone of excellence. Uh, McCormick's is like this multi-billion dollar spice company. Oh, okay, I recognize If if you open up your spice, whatever, Mm -hmm. cabinet, like there's probably like these spices with like a red top, right? Like that's all McCormick's, right? $24 billion company? Wow. In sales? In sales? Market Market cap. cap. Wow. Public company. Yeah. So it's just like, like, you know, why isn't there like the, I don't know, the apple of black pepper? Like, I don't really know how to do this <laughs> shit. Right. But like, right. like what's the, uh, what's like, well, I think for this one, you're, you're right. You can go either higher end or, you know, the, just the more fun look at, but just branding, packaging, design and influencer most importantly. So like, who is the, uh, you know, the, whatever, the Martha Stewart of YouTube that you can partner with that can be the face of a brand like this, right? Like who, who has that kind of brand and gravitas that can get into a target or, uh, or the store shelves at, at supermarkets uh, to compete with something like this. And I think that's, that's the way I would go if I was going to do this. Yeah. hundred percent. I think the thing that's interesting about this, and I don't know anything about McCormick's is like the bundling, like, you know, if you buy salt, you need pepper. If you need pepper, you might be needing oregano and you might need whatever flakes that they sell out there. Right. And so yeah, you could just keep stamping this out across like every spice category. But yeah, this is not one. This is outside of my zone of excellence. So I ain't Dude, doing this they, one, but I like it. They own everything. I didn't realize this. Have you guys ever, have you ever seen this protein bar at gas stations called Tiger's Milk? <laughs> no. Have you ever is that seen? Theirs? <laughs> yes, they own this bar. It's the worst looking, like it's basically a label. It looks like it was like drawn by Kenny Powers or like, it looks like if Power Rangers ate a protein bar, this is what they would eat. And it's just like, it's called tiger milk. And it has a, it has a face of a tiger and it's like the protein bar. They own that. They own a bunch of different stuff. This is awesome. I, yeah, I, I, I totally should have, um, you know, they own Frank's Red Hot. That's my favorite. So yeah, what a, what a company. I didn't, re- I didn't realize that these guys were what they are. That's wild, man. They were created in the 1800s. Yeah. I mean, yeah, they're just, you know, brand recognition and everybody knows, I mean, if you go to the spice aisle, it's all of them. Like they just own the whole thing. Right. So you got to come up with a distribution hack here, but that's, you know, Sean, that's probably more your world than, than mine, but yeah, for sure. Can I ask you a quick question different from my ideas, but about money. So I'm not going to, you can say it if you want, I'm going to assume that you own a, a, a chunk that you are on paper worth mid to high low to low to high hundreds of millions of dollars. Have you taken any money out of your company or has your only income for the last, I think you said 10 years you've been running this just been like a, a, a normal mild salary? Yeah. So I didn't, I didn't pay myself for the first four years. So when we raised money, then I basically took my back salary. And then since then I've not, uh, not taken any money off the table. So yeah, I'm, I'm, foolishly long or brilliantly long CB insights. We'll, we'll see what, we'll see how things play out, but yeah, I'm, I'm all in. Were you wealthy before you started the company? Like, did you have banker wealth? So just- no, 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 no. I just, you know, I got married right before I started the company. I told my wife when we were dating that I'm, I don't want to work at a big company anymore. And we're going to like, there's going to, there's going to be some lean times. And so she was down. And so I just saved religiously like we didn't go on vacations with friends and just like you know and it was always like awkward because they're like oh do you want to go somewhere and i'm like oh i'm super busy but because I, I just was like no i don't have money so yeah i just <laughs> saved like crazy. i'm busy i'm busy being poor right now so i can't go sorry i'll check the calendar when i'm yeah. not poor i'll start going <laughs> i just saved a ton of money and then yeah for the first like two years of cbi I just paid for 
a small team out of my pocket and then we started generating revenue. But wait, wh- why haven't you taken a few million bucks just off the table just to make your life a little bit better? It wouldn't, it would have no material output. Uh, yes. Uh, okay. yeah, I- and, and by the way, j- just so we have numbers, you basically have only made, I imagine, middle hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in salary. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, I'm I now get paid like a fair CEO salary, right? So it, I'm not like it's not like one of these big public company guys, but like, um, yeah, I think I just we've been really focused on the business, and like I just think it's a giant opportunity. And candidly, part of the reason we didn't raise in the beginning was because I don't think I'm good at pitching, and I also worked in venture, and I didn't like want to work for my investors. Right. Like that was always like a very guiding principle of mine. Like, you know, and I look at S1s of companies that go public and I'm like, you know, the founder owns like 5%. I'm like, that's right. just like, that's a backwards calculation. Yeah. Probably, you know, should have, could have taken money off over the course of time. Uh, right now would not be a good time to do that given where the markets are. So I figure we'll just keep growing out of this current sort of malaise that we're in. And then you know, opportunities sort of tend to present themselves. Even our fundraise was like a customer sent us a term sheet over email. I can't find this client info. Have you heard of HubSpot? HubSpot is a CRM platform, so it shares its data across every application. Every team can stay aligned. No out of sync spreadsheets or dueling databases. HubSpot, grow better. Tell the story of the, of, tell the, story of the guy who offered you $100 million via DM. Uh, <laughs> how did that go? <laughs> some, you know, I get some interesting DMs on Twitter. And so somebody offered a hundred million. I, you know, I think this guy was broke as a joke, but it was still funny. Mm-hmm. I said, uh, you know, not interested, not looking to sell. And I think then the email chain kind of devolved from there where he was <laughs> like, you know, I'm going to build a competitor and put you out of business. And uh, yeah, it was good. What's you know, his name? I don't recall. I don't recall. It, it, it was like some. You, you blurted out of the I thing. Think I blurted but it, out. Yeah. So, 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 so he sends this DM. And you posted the DM screenshots. It starts like, hey, here's who I am. Really interested, uh, you know, in partnering or, or an acquisition. Uh, let's talk. Please call me. And then you were like, thanks. Yeah. Not even thanks. THX. Right. Just like the, the short thanks. Um, not for sale. Nice. And he goes, and then he goes, how about a partnership? And then he just keeps going and he's like, here's, how about this? I'll give you a hundred million dollars for the business. You are now, if <laughs> your fiduciary responsibilities is you have to present this to your board. You know, um, you know that <laughs> let's go. <laughs> and then you go, you go, okay, interesting strategy. Uh, best of luck. And he goes, so do you accept the offer? <laughs> and then he, then he devolves into, all right, then I'm going to create a competitor. Have you seen this competitor launch? Is he, uh, is he eating your lunch yet or what? Surprise, surprise. We're, yeah, we're tracking religiously to see when this launches, but yeah, nothing, <laughs> not, nothing yet. You should, you, you should DM him back. Be like, hey, how's it going, man? Uh, <laughs> curious about the launch details. Yeah, yeah. No, that was, that was atypical. I think most of my, my DMs are, are nice, but yeah, that one was a little, a little out there. What would you do with the money now if you sold? Um, I mean... I think the thing I'd do is I want to build a school of entrepreneuring. Like I think education is broken. Uh, and so I think like kids should just learn how to build businesses and not go to college. And so that's what I do. And I think there's a bunch of colleges that are struggling that I could go buy like a, a plot and build like a dope campus for, for a bunch of like high achieving kids. And we'll just like go figure out how, how much would that take? I have no idea. I have no idea. This is like, but you'll much. have it. This is my distant dream. But yeah, I, th- I think like, uh, I just read a, a great book called The Case Against Education uh, that kind of breaks this down. And it's really interesting. And uh, yeah, I think it's like, I think there's an interesting thing to be done there. And, uh, and then, yeah, I'd love to like do some stuff in India along that lines. But yeah, this will be my last true startup. Uh, I've, I've looked into a bunch of, uh, uh, I have like alerts set for colleges for sale because I had a, a similar dream and idea at, at one point in time. I, I've, I now don't want to do this, but uh, it's amazing. You can buy full college campuses for sometimes single digit millions, sometimes just like 10 to $15 million. It's crazy. Like Which it, ones? It, it has to be less than the, the replacement cost 
of just the buildings and the land on the in, in, in this these places. So so I am not sure why. And these are accredited universities. The, a lot of them are are they start as just like they do one like thing. It's like just cosmetology or just whatever. There's like there's like those. Those are really cheap. Those are like you know, one point five million. You can have a, a you know a university a college that does that. All the way up to here's a campus in New York for this like small liberal arts college that's not doing so well. And like, you know, for $15 million, you could take the whole thing. And um, I'm like, is there wow. like a marketplace for that? Is there a Zillow for bankrupt universities? Uh, there should be, but there's uh, this one website called DealStream that ha happens to have most of them that I see. Um, so DealStream will send me emails of one, like, you know, multi campus beauty school. Here you go. Um, you know, that just got this email two days ago. <laughs> what made you sour on this idea, Sean? Uh, just like the lifestyle component. I was like, would I like, would I want to actually, if I was going to do this, it was like, okay, I'm going to basically go be the Dean of the school. And I'm going to like, basically this will be my baby and uh, I will make this great. And I was like, oh, it's a lot easier to just like have a business. I could just do on my phone and my laptop, you know, four hours a day and not worry about this and just hang out with my kids and, and, you know, have fun. And so I was like, okay, yeah, I, there's an all in version of entrepreneurship that I'm no longer like super interested in because that would require um you know same thing like i'd rather do this podcast than go speak at events i think in the last three years i got invited to speak at maybe 150 events and i've said yes to two of them right like you know so it's like you could make good money and grow your audience doing this but nah seems like a lot of work you know <laughs> i think i'll try to just win the way i want sean have you ever um have you read the blog post that Anon made years ago about I think your father or someone in your family got sick and they couldn't run their factory in India anymore and you had to go. Did you have to run the factory? I, I have it right now. His dad. Yeah, my father passed away in April 2017, and so he had a chemical business in India. And uh, yeah, you know, like he built it over many years, and and like I was like, all right, I can't just let it go to zero. So I ran it while I was running CBI for about 18 months. The, the title of the blog post is how to manage and sell a company in an industry and a company and a country you don't know. <laughs> and uh, it's kind of great. It's like a full, like full length sort of like, here's the whole thing. Um, do you want to tell like the short version of the story and then people can go read the blog? Yeah. I mean, so uh, he died on April 17th, 2017. And as we're going to cremate him, we're Hindu and uh, this worker from the factory comes up to me in Hindi. My Hindi is pretty weak, but I understand it. And the worker was basically like, "In you know, what's going to happen to us, right? And I was like, you know, I'm like a mess, but I was like, all right, I guess like there is this thing. And my mom and him basically built this business over 20 years, you know, kind of like a small chemical company, like nothing. What's that nothing mean? Gargantuan uh, in terms of size. No, or chemical. What's a chemical? Company? Oh, it was like a, it was a. Um, it was, it's in a sector called fine chemicals. So it was a raw material that goes into perfumes and like uh, fla flavors and fragrances, right? Okay. And so he built it, one of three manufacturers in the world that could make this product. It was a really finicky product. Um, and like, I'm like, all right, I guess I got to run this. And like, my dad was like a mad scientist, like off the chart smart. And I'm like, I'm not that, right? And so, uh, so I'm like, okay, what do I do here? Like, cause I don't, if something goes wrong in the factory, I can't help. So the only thing I can do is probably try to bring in more business. So I just went online and like cold called every large chemical company that's in this space. And I was like, hey, we make this product. If you ever need it, like come, you know, come talk to us. So we had like our best couple of quarters ever when I was running it. And Because you were doing outbound and he, he wasn't doing any or he just wasn't doing it well. My dad was just like, he was a. Sign. He was like a product guy, so he's like the best product will win, right? And well, like, put this put this picture up on the YouTube channel of the blog post where it's it's the side of the building it looks like, and it just says on one side good quality, and then there's a giant equal sign, and then it just says good business. <laughs> and that's like the, it looks like as is that the side of the building as you approach to walk in, it's just like hey reminder. Yeah, I, was I was entering the factory. Yeah, good quality equals good business. <laughs> And like Times New Roman font. <laughs> oh my gosh, this is awesome. <laughs> so yeah, I was just like, I can try to go sell because I can't help on the technical side. The team he had assembled was awesome. So they kept the factory running, you know, got, had good sales. People kept reaching out to buy it. You know, a lot of them like, you know, when somebody, once a proprietor dies, like a lot of bottom feeders show up. 
So yeah. I was just like trying to make sure that these weren't those people because I wanted to make sure the team landed on their feet. And then, yeah, just navigated through it. I uh, met a, ba- a banker who was representing this buyer. They were above board people. And yeah, after 18 months for a while, because I'm like insanely ambitious, I was like, oh, I'll have like CBI as the data arm and I'll have like this industrial <laughs> arm and we'll build that. <laughs> and then like, you know. It'd be a fucking tycoon. Yeah. Well, I mean, for it, you know, and then I was like telling my wife, I was like, yo, we got to have more kids. Cause like, if we want to build, you gotta like, you gotta have a lot of kids to like, take this, take all these, uh, these arms of this industrial conglomerate up. And she's like, you're insane. And then, uh, and then yeah, like 10 weeks here or you know, six weeks here, 10 days in India. Like, I mean, yeah, I, like that was brutal. So then I was just like, all right, I got to sell this. And then was fortunate to sell it and the team's still all there and yeah, everything worked out. So what did you sell it for? Uh, I can't disclose a good, I mean, like a good amount. Yeah, it was, it was, you know, I wasn't optimizing for the dollars. I was optimizing for a clean deal to a person who would not fire everybody that my dad built the business with. So, you know, so I'm sure I could have gone to somebody else who would have like torn it down and, you know, done other things with it, but I felt really good about these guys. So yeah, I think it like it achieved non-financial objectives that I think were more important to my mom and to me than maybe the financial objectives. This is a really, really good blog post that you have. And it kind of got lost over the years. You guys got to share this again more. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was, uh, yeah, it was, uh, you know, the team at CBI, I got to give them credit. Like, I mean, I was kind of an absentee CEO for a little bit and they like kept the trains running on time. So yeah, it was, it was a, it was a good, yeah, a, a good thing to accomplish. I was glad, to, glad to get. You, ha- you had some like takeaways on the M and A process. Uh, I'm curious. I'll, I'll just read the headlines, but you can decide which one of these you think you have a, a strong point of view on or strong message to, to deliver here. So, you said, should I have hired an investment bank? And you're like, I didn't have one. I represented myself. Maybe I should have. Uh, you said, don't let lawyers run the process. So lawyers are often trying to mitigate risk, but it's easy to just like have everybody get entrenched in like, you know, risk management and not actually have the deal go through. Uh, Don't sweat the small stuff. Uh, Quote, the industry standard is a phrase to watch out for. So give me your thoughts on one of these. The industry standard one, I think is like the one that like I hate because like people only use that when they can't justify the term. They just say like, oh no, no, but that's just industry standard. How we do things. We always do things that way. There's no such thing as industry standard, right? Like if it's it's if it's good for you, then it's what you should aim for. And that you know it's somewhat somewhat counter to the sweat the small stuff thing. So you don't want to negotiate on every little thing. But when I hear it's industry standard, like my ears always perk up because it's like somebody's like trying to get one over on me on this, right? <laughs> or they're just trying to like make it they sweep this under the rug. So I think that's an important one. Uh, you know, sweat the small stuff. I think like put some stuff in that you want to negotiate on that you don't care about that you're just willing to give on. Right. But like, you know, just don't make the pay, you know, don't make the negotiation super painful in all regards on bankers. Like I think for this deal, it didn't make sense to use a banker. And I have, I mean, with CBI, I have a bunch of data on like what comps are and all that stuff. So I had, it was good enough and it wasn't a big enough deal that I wanted to like cut in somebody for, you know, five, 7%, you know, if CBI was doing a deal now, like we'd absolutely have a banker. Cause I, I've definitely seen like the value of what a great banker offers. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the, the industry standard stuff is probably the thing. Like anytime you hear that, I think an entrepreneur should like, just wonder like, okay, why are they just pushing for industry standard in this particular area? Cause it usually it's always industry standard to the benefit of the person across the table. It's never industry standard and good for you. Uh, and so that's one I, I would definitely right. push on. Can we, um, one thing happened over the weekend, Sean, that you and I had talked about, and I actually think it's a good time to talk about it now because I have a feeling that Anand's going to know a little bit about it. Do you remember, uh, uh probably two months ago, we talked about this guy named Gautam Adani. I think his name is, you know, what I'm talking about you were like, I mean, you're not to blame. We were just using the news and you were like, this guy's amazing. Look at what he's doing. He kind of looks like an Indian Mario guy. And he's like doing all this cool stuff where he's like, doesn't really care about looking cool. And he gives his money away, yada, yada, yada. And now he's like the third or first richest man in the the world. The news was, I think he had gotten to second or third richest man in the world. And I didn't think most people knew his name. I says, hey, there's this guy, Adani. Here's what he does. And I think we even said it. I don't remember really saying this, but a lot of people DM being like, you guys called it 
because news came out that there's like some fraud going on or whatever with their company. And I guess we had said something that was like, you know, either this is just amazing or, you know, you never know because of whatever. I, I, we have to go back and listen. I, I'm not sure what the what the clip was, but a lot of people like you guys called that, which. Yeah, I, people were saying that, too. And I'm like, I said thanks, but I don't actually remember. Yeah, I, don't, I don't remember calling that. I do remember when I was reading about it was a lot of people were like, hey, this is kind of a shell game. Like he's basically raising money. He's raising money in one company using the like basically borrowing against another company that he owns. And that company's borrowed against another company that he owns. And he had like so many entities that were each sort of like um, the justification for the next uh, in terms of either the valuation or borrowing money or what, whatever it was. I don't I mean, I, this is a couple months ago. I don't even remember what the details were, but I think we just said that as a footnote. It's not like we were calling him out on anything. I think people are giving us a little more credit than we deserved on that one. So uh, sorry to interrupt you, Sam. So yeah, what so saying that's that the back. That's the background. So uh, I think on Friday, Hindenburg Research. I think they're a short seller, so they they short companies, but they produce scathing reports, and they've done this a dozen times. I, I can't. I'm sure a non new product should probably know some of their examples, but they're just like known for these really good reports. Well, they'll write and say this company we think is total bullshit. Here's why, and then it tanks, and obviously they are in, uh, financially incentivized to for it to tank. But as far as I'm concerned, I, I think some of the research is actually kind of spot on sometimes and, and they have like a good track record. But uh, Anand, have you followed this? I followed it a little bit. I mean, I like Hindenburgs. I think like there's like we live in like the age of grifters. And so like you need people and I don't know if Adani is, but I think like you need people like Hindenburg who like, you know, or Coffeezilla or like Wendover Productions or any of these folks that are out there even on YouTube who are trying to hold and at least shine a light on some of the griftiness that's out there. And so I, you know, I like what they do in at a high level. I don't know if their case with the Donnie is like a good one or a bad one, but yeah. Yeah. Well, basically they, they said like the entire company, it, it, like there's a bunch of weird things going on with it. Um, of all the, like he, it, they list all these companies and each person that runs one of the companies is one of his like relatives or former executives. So it's all like, kind of like, uh, uh, it's kind of like his cronies are kind of like running everything. And yeah, he's like loaning money from other companies that he owns and he's making the valuations of each of those companies really high. And so it turns out it's, a, it's basically like a little FTX esque where uh, of just like similar or entities that he owns loaning money to other entities with the collateral being a company that he values himself among other things. And so anyway, I thought you guys would have like an interesting take on this because I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. spent a little time in India. You're in the finance world. So I wasn't sure if you, if you had a, an opinion there. Yeah. No, I, I don't have an opinion on that. I, I will say like when you see like org structures that are really convoluted, like, you know, FTX or Adani or Enron before that, like people always like in the moment are just like, oh, these guys are geniuses. They figured out how to move stuff and do X, <laughs> Y, and Z. And then when you look back, it's always like, no, it was just like a giant shell game, you know, as Sean said, like that, that that's an interesting lens, I think, to look at companies through when it's like the innovation isn't the product. The innovation is like cap structure or some weird thing. It's like, okay, that's a weird, that's a kind of a weird business to build, right? Where like that's what you're innovating on. Uh, it's like companies that innovate in HR, right? Like I'm always just like, you know, they're right. doing all these weird things. It's like, don't you have to build a product? Like, why are you doing like, 3.5 days of work and like, you know, all this okay. weird shit. It's just like, why don't you just work and like build a product? So have you been able to capture uh, or like catch any scams just or like make any right predictions based off the data that you guys have? Yeah, I mean, we don't we don't publish that stuff. We usually send it to media, right? Because we're not like a media outlet, but we'll find stuff where we're like, you know, this company raised that I'm not going to name, but there was a company recently that raised like at a $4 billion valuation. And then when you looked at like the founders and you looked at like the number of employees and everything, it was like, something's off here. Right. And so, you know, and so like we would send it to somebody and say like, Hey, like this looks odd. Like you should go do what journalists do and dig into it. So we'll find stuff that's a little odd at times. And then, you know, I think the more interesting thing sometimes is like, you'll dig into filings of companies after they've been acquired by a public company. And you see, it's not, this isn't like a, a scam or anything, but you just see like, you know, hot company that says they got acquired. And then you actually see how much the public company paid for them. And it's like, you know, one eighth of what they raised. Right. And so like, you just sort of get, it shines a light on like, what was a real success versus what isn't. I think that's probably what we tend to see more 
you know, people who are want to do fraud or like if they're good, they're hard to catch, period. Right. Like it's just not something that and it's also not where we the, spend our time. Also, some of these things like the same exact signal that later you look at and you say, oh, man, we should have known something was off. Like you said, at the beginning, it's a sign of of the genius of the of what's going on. Like uh, I know with FTX, um, there was a, a bunch of things that now people are like, wow, this is. You know, those should have been red flags, but at the same time, those were the things that in stories they were saying were like kind of the the remarkable things about uh, about them. Like, you know, um, for example, the, you know, like, oh, the, the they, you know, the, they, they all sleep in the same house and on beanbags and whatever. And now it's like, oh, they had this weird, like inappropriate, you know, like sort of like group dating thing going on. But it's like uh, at, before that, it was like, these are just 20 something year olds that you know, are all like, you know, living in this hacker house that are making it happen. It's like, no, if on one hand it's one thing. And then, then like, you know, after it's exposed, it becomes labeled as another. And I've seen this with, I've seen this many times where it's like, oh, you know, same thing. Sam Bankman Freed is this, uh, sort of like this, this, you know, this quirky genius. And then he turns out to be this sort of like, uh, you know, this drugged up liar. <laughs> it's like the same thing he was doing before where he's you know, taking whatever, you know, Adderall or whatever the hell he's taking in order to, um, you know, stay up and trade. It was like, yeah, these guys are fueled by, you know, you know, Red Bull and whatever. And they're just working, you know, they're, they're geniuses that are outsmarting everybody in the market to like their gamblers who were reckless and, uh, you know, were not making good decisions because of, you know, their lifestyle and what they were choosing to do. And I've seen this, this happen before. I remember with Tesla, um, there was a point in time where I think Tesla had had like, 10 or 15 different CFOs. And uh, my friend had told me this because I was like, you know, I'm reading a lot of stuff online about how like there's might just be like some, you know, there's a lot of smoke. I don't know if there's a fire, but there's a lot of smoke about Tesla not being in good financial shape. What do you guys think? You know, what do you think about this? Am I, am I overreacting to these like conspiracy theorists on Reddit and, and Twitter? And he's like, well, he's like, I noticed something interesting. He goes, I always have this phrase, follow the CFOs. Like the CFOs know the health of the business. And what you never want to see was what was happening with Tesla, which was like a rotating door of CFOs that would come in for three to six months and then leave. And secondly, um, like the new CFO, it's like the shy 24 year old or 26 year old. That's, you know, now Tesla CFO. Wow. He's amazing. The same thing happened at FTX. I remember when we, we did, we were, uh, they were sponsoring us for something and the guy who was paying us um, was their head of strategy. And we, you know, I, I didn't go on the call, but I asked Ben later. I was like, so was he like, you know, super sharp or what was that guy's story? He goes, like yeah, 18. he's 24, he's 23 <laughs> years old or 24 years old. And he started as whatever. And now he's promoted. He's like the, he's the head of strategy for all of FTX. And again, it was like, wow, that's crazy. I guess they're just a real meritocracy around there. And they just, you know, it's a land of e equal opportunity. And this guy just proved his worth. Or it's like, no, this is his college buddy. He's not going to ask too many questions and he can just trust him to, to do whatever and say whatever, right? Like these things from the outside. I remember reading articles about this wonder kid and, uh, and then later it's like a bad thing. And you were right about the CFO thing with Tesla at that time. Weren't, weren't they on the brink? Well, people don't talk about that much now, but it did seem like they were on the brink or, you know, just, you know, narrowly survived either, either properly or improperly. I'm not sure. But like later, I remember one, one, uh, interview, Elon finally admitted it. He, he was like, we were six weeks away from like, you know, the show being over for Tesla with the, when they were having the model three production ramp. And, uh, and he had said something in a separate interview that alarmed me as well, which, which was about, um, there was like some, what's that famous like green, clean energy thing that Obama funded, like, like the green new it, deal or something. No, it was like $600 million to soy Vera, soy Lent, soy, whatever. I don't know. Some so soy legend. I don't know what it was. Some company that uh, got a bunch of money and it failed. And like up until the day they declared bankruptcy, it was like, we're, we're good. I don't know what you guys are talking about. And Solyndra, that's exactly right. And they asked Elon about that. Like, you know, does clean energy get a bad rap because of the, you know, the problems with Solyndra and others. People say it's hard to make new tech work and all this stuff. And he said something in a, in a separate interview where he was like, what are they supposed to say? As soon as they, if they ever admitted any weakness, the stock would tank and it would guarantee their demise. Like they have to say, it's all good. You guys are nuts. Whether they are or aren't, because the other one is, is it, 
it will tank their stock and they will die for sure. It'll accelerate their death. So then I was like, well, you can't believe anything this guy says about how Tesla's doing if that's his mentality when they're, you know, I'm reading these things about how they might be on the brink. He's saying they're all fine, but he even says that that's the CEO's job in this situation. So now, you know, what to do? And that's a long story short about why I sold my Tesla stock too early. Yeah, I, I do think like there's the signal that I look for, it's not in the data, is like the narrative when it's like a crazy founder narrative. Like, uh, like, they were in Southeast Asia living in a monastery and they talk about like their clothing choices. Like that's always a weird one, right? When it's like, we're not going to talk about the business. We're going to talk about like they wear some like moleskin t-shirt made from like, you know. Dude, but it, it worked with Zuck. Yeah, but he wasn't like, he built a product to start. He wasn't known for his like weird. I think it's the key thing when you can't ish. see the product or the, or the financials, right? Like, like for a lot of these things where it's like, is the product legit? And is, are the financials like visible, right? But, but even then you can't like, you know, FTX was a, like a real product that, that people used and the financials made sense at the time that like, they were obviously going to, they're making money on every trade, right? So people doing a lot of crypto trading. How can they not make money? Um, you know, it seemed like it would work in both cases. Another example on the FTX side, they had 25 engineers. And I remember reading stories about how, he was just like, yeah, we create, like, we're not like these Silicon Valley companies with all this bloat. Coinbase has like, you know, thousands of employees. We have a whole engineering team of 25 and we do more volume than them because we hire 10 X engineers and we, we go for extreme operational leverage. And later it was like, of course, these guys had like terrible security practices and all the stuff. Like they didn't even have the, they, they refused to even invest in engineering. Right. It's like the same story, the two sides of the same story. Once you, once you know the result. Yeah, hundred percent. I, I do think there's signals when it, I don't think fraud, but there's signals right now that companies are not doing well, right? So like you'll see companies raise at a billion dollar valuation, and when we dig in, we see like the liquidation preference is three x, but that stuff doesn't get reported, right? Or you see the CRO right. or the CMO leaves every six months, kind of to Sean's point on the CFO, like that indicates there's problems. It's not fraud. It's just like hey, this company's not killing it the way outsiders might look at it. I think fraud's a tough one. I think underperformance and and companies that are not doing well that's a lot easier for us to figure out what's a company Dude. that's impressed you that we most people don't talk about because you guys see a bunch of companies that are that are interesting what's a company that's uh kind of flies under the radar but kind of secretly crushes it i'm like a data it's gonna be it's probably gonna end up in the data world um <laughs> so let me think that's of right. what I like. um i don't know if anybody i will say like the area that I like right now, and I don't think these are great businesses, but I think like, I think are interesting is like the, the, the folks that are uh, analyzing the grifters, right? Like I really like love this space. Cause I think there's something to be built here. Like they're more media companies than they are great big tech companies. Um, but there was like, there's a couple that like are digging into like pastors and like the whole like evangelical pastor world. And like, it's phenomenal, like the stuff that they, they do. So like, that's probably the area I go down a lot more in. And then like looking at the businesses of folks like Andrew Schultz and folks like that, like, you know, cause I think there's a lot to learn from how they do marketing and how they build audience. So I tend to look at businesses that I think we can learn from versus like, just like random sort of businesses that are out there. Um, what, what, what can a boring company like yours learn from Andrew Schultz? <laughs> <laughs> so the thing that, so I think the thing that he's done really, well, I, I was purposely insulting you in order to uh, make, make the average listener be like, oh yeah, I'm not that cool. I, can I think the thing that he does really well is he doesn't just interview other comedians, right? I think he like, <coughs> he interviews other people who are kind of adjacent to him, right? And so what he does then is he keeps expanding his audience. And I think most other folks like, you know, like I like Theo Vaughn and Theo Vaughn's like interviewing other comedians. Right? right. But like he interviewed Neil deGrasse Tyson and I bet you that brought him a whole bunch of new people. Right. And so I think and like, it was very funny. Yeah, it was awesome. And so this sort of like Schultz strategy of like adjacent folks, I think is really smart to bring in like the Venn diagram is not as heavily overlapped. And I think like he keeps building that way, which I think is really interesting. And so for us, like, it's always like, who has an audience that's not exactly our audience, but that has maybe a slight overlap? And but would those people kind of like us if they knew about us, right? And so it's kind of like thinking about partnerships there, whether it's newsletter partnerships or whether it's, you know, research that we do, whatever it might be. So 
Yeah, I think like looking at what's happening in the consumer side of media is always interesting because that's where like the innovation tends to happen. It doesn't usually tend to happen in B2B. Well, dude, I appreciate you doing this. You're fun to talk to. Sean, what do you think? And we, we only got through maybe half of the half of the shortlist ideas. So uh, if people like this, we should do a part two and, uh, and do more, do more of the ideas. Thanks for coming on, man. This is fun. And I uh, appreciate, you know, that you've been, you know, come, I, I feel like I've seen you tweet about the show, you know, for a while now. So, you know, that's uh, I really appreciate that. That's one of the cool moments of this doing this for us is that people we respect if they like our stuff too, that gives you a little extra juice, a little extra wind in your sails to uh, to go out and keep going. Because it's it's different than just, oh, the numbers are going up. But numbers don't have that same kind of like pull as, you know, um, somebody who you think is cool, you know, l- liking your stuff. And by the way, Adnan, it's your fault. It's kind of my fault. It's most, it's part of your fault. Basically, I get like lots of messages a day, but like five of them a day. It's usually a young man in his 20s and he'll just message me and he'll say let's fuck that's all i get and the reason being one time i was either on my way home or in route to the airport and i was ta- i hate flying so i take a lot of xanax and so that's the only time i'm ever inebriated and i was very high and i messaged you and i said i'm in your hood let's fuck and you replied like I'm down. Like, <laughs> here's a restaurant. Meet me there, or something like that. And I told that story, and uh, now because of that, I get I get a bunch of men messaging me that. Of, of, living, so. living the dream, Sam. You're living the dream. Someone's dream. Someone's dream. Not my dream, but someone's dream. <laughs> yeah, I'm living. I'm living on person's dream. <laughs> <laughs> so uh you're to play for that but i appreciate you coming on and uh this is fun we'll talk soon all right thanks guys Bye.